Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video we're going to be discussing designing scientific experiments. How do we set out to, to carry out a scientific investigation? What are the things that we need to think about when we're planning it? How do we go about carrying that investigation out? We're going to go through all of those processes and things today. We're going to start by thinking about what are you trying to achieve? When we're thinking about a purpose for our experiment, what do you think is going to happen when you start? What are you going to test and how are you going to test it? What equipment are you going to need in order to do your investigation? And how are you actually going to, what steps are you going to follow? How are you going to carry it out? And then how are you going to organize and collect your data? And then once you have your data, how are you going to display it in order to get meaning from it? We're going to go through each of these things in turn. So firstly, what am I trying to achieve? We call this the aim. It's the purpose of the experiment. You know, what are you actually trying to do? What information are you trying to find out? Maybe it's a question that you're trying to answer or a problem that you're trying to solve. Okay, that all of these is kind of where you start. And it, it, for us as scientists, it starts from questioning and curiosity about something. Now, it might be a simple something or it might be a really complicated something. Some, you know, scientists will spend their whole life trying to chase after a particular goal and following lots of little steps to get there. But in our investigation that we structure, we think about an aim. Think about what you're trying to achieve. Okay? What do you think is going to happen? We call this a hypothesis. Essentially, it's a making a prediction about what's going to happen. Think about a show like Mythbusters. Mythbusters start with a myth. That's the purpose, that, uh, how they, you know, where they begin. And then once they kind of set out what the myth is, and then they decide that how they're going to test it, they make a prediction about whether they think that myth is going to be busted, confirmed, or maybe plausible, you know, or some other kind of conclusion. So they make a prediction from this, the start, which is then something we can reflect on at the end. So for example, a hypothesis might be, if the drop height of a ball is increased, its rebound height will also increase. You know, so thinking about a bouncing ball kind of experiment. Now, part of the, the language here is, is part of what we're working towards. We, you know, we can frame our prediction, our hypothesis in very simple language to start with, but ultimately we want to really practice that scientific language and saying rather than just say, if I drop it hot from a higher spot, it'll rebound higher. Let's see if we can switch out some of that language and using words like increase. And, and we're also then referring to the two things that we're going to be looking for in our test. So this brings us to what we call our variables. Now there is another Kuiper Labs video specifically on variables, so I'll, I'll let you kind of watch that through for some extra detail here. But essentially in an experiment we have three types of variables. A variable is anything that can change in an experiment. It can vary. Okay, but so we have one variable that we're choosing to deliberately change. And technically we call this the independent variable. We have another variable which is what we're measuring what we're actually looking and we're looking to find out more about and we call that the dependent variable. Some other times we might call it the responding variable. You know, that's just a particular terminology. And then in the experiment, everything else aside from these two things, we want to keep exactly the same so we can make a fair test. And we call these variables controlled. We're, we're making sure that they stay the same. We're not leaving them up to chance. So change, measure, same. Independent, dependent, controlled. And there's a little, a little mnemonic that you can use to remember this. Cows moo softly and I don't care. C-M-S-I-D-C. -S okay, and then when we're thinking about our variables, particularly for our, our um, changed and measured variables, we've got to think about what units are we measuring in or are we, are we using for that variable? Now, that's not, a, not always going to be relevant. Um, some variables will just be word categories. Um, but other things might be involved measuring in centimetres or seconds, millimetres, you know, so that there's some property that we're measuring there. Or it might be just a number, you know, one of this, two of this, three of this, four of this. Okay, so we need to, be, to keep that in mind because that frames what we need to look for in our equipment or our materials. So we say, all right, well, what equipment do I need in order to actually carry out this experiment? How are you going to set it up? So physically, what's going to be connected to what? And then how can you record how you did it? Okay, because it's all well and good to set this up, an amazing thing up, but if you've got no idea later to come back and, and revisit it or to, to tell someone else about it, then it doesn't have the same impact. Okay, so here we've got kind of three sort of general setups for some different experiments, whether it's a bouncing ball or, you know, heating up to look at energy content of food or a toy car down a ramp. Each of these represents a, a, a setup 
of equipment. And so thinking through, okay, well, what am I going to need to make sure it can happen? What am I going to need to measure it? And so on. You need to think through that and plan through the details. In the same way that if you're trying out a recipe, you need to make sure that you have the saucepans, the fry pans, the mixing bowls, the specific equipment that you need to get it done. Because if you're halfway through the recipe and realize that you need something you don't have, it gets very tricky to finish it. And then how, okay, so say you've got your purpose, you've thought about what you're measuring, you've made a prediction, you've got all the equipment, how are you actually going to do it? What are you going to look for? We call this your method. Um, and other word that we use is this one here called procedure. So the steps that get followed, starting with a verb in most situations. So as far as it's an action step, it's listing the, the things that you'll need to follow in order to carry out the experiment. So you're planning out a process that you can also use to keep it the same each time. We also use repetition, this idea that in our process that we want to make sure that if there's a fluke result, that we can see that it's a fluke by doing it enough times to, to spot the, the average kind of trend. So in our method that we make sure we do at least three or more trials or testing it that many times. You can see in these instructions using at least five times in this particular experiment that's here. Okay, the more times, the better. How am I going to organize my data? So once I start collecting results, where am I going to put them? How am I going to make sure that I can be organized, systematic about it? Okay, so here's an example of a results table that we might use for that drop height, rebound height experiment. Okay, notice it's got a title, it's got headings for the variables, it's got spaces for our trials, and an average as well, so we can work out how that, how that looks. And we've also got spaces to include all, at least three different versions of this variable. Because we want to make sure that we're really properly testing this. We're not giving it a really, you know, half-baked kind of effort. Okay, so it helps us with the data collection, and it also makes sure it's organized together. So we can see, you know, we've got a place to put things, but it's also um, really, you know, in an organized fashion. And then once we've collected our data, how do we display it? How do we show the patterns in the information that we've gathered? in a way that gives us the chance to find meaning and trends and relationships. This is where a graph comes in. Okay, so that by putting all the data there and we're plotting it here, you can see trends and relationships so much more easily. So you can see with this one that it's easy to see that as the drop height goes up, that the rebound height also goes up in a really um, consistent sort of way. And it means, but then the, the thing you have to, to consider is saying, all right, well, you're gonna do a graph at the end. If you're gonna do it, and what type of graph is appropriate, column or line, the two main ones that we might use in a science experiment. And um, so there's a lot more information we can go into about that. Um, we'll save that for a, a, a different opportunity, but essentially it relates to what type of information are you putting on the bottom of your graph? Are you putting a number scale like this one, in which case it needs to be a line graph, or are we using word categories um, like type of, you know, type of surface being carpet, lino, um, concrete, that, that sort of thing where it's a word description rather than a number measurement. Um, yeah, okay. So we've talked about saying, all right, in a science experiment, you've got to decide what you're trying to achieve. We call that the aim. You make a prediction about what's going to happen. That's our hypothesis. What are you going to test and how are you going to do it is planning out our variables. What equipment are you going to need? So planning your materials. So whether that's measurement equipment, whether that's other equipment that you're going to need to set up, and how are you going to do that? How are you going to carry out the experiment? So what steps are you going to follow and in what order, including the opportunity for repetition? How are you going to organize the results you're going to collect? So using a results table to place them in. And how are you going to display your data? So using a graph to be able to show that once the experiment's done, so you can see the patterns. These are all the sorts of things that we need to think about when planning a scientific experiment. Thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.